Welcome to Book Talk with Kara. It is so much fun to have Amanda Dykes with me today. Some of you have probably read her award-winning novels, and I am excited because we are here to talk about her latest, Born of Gilded Mountains, which is set during one of my favorite time periods, the 1940s, specifically 1948. But what I also love about this one is she is pulling Hollywood, in my favorite time period in Hollywood, into this along with the Colorado mountains. So all these different elements that I love. But before we start talking about it, Amanda, do you wanna just introduce yourself quickly and then we'll dive into all the books sure. and writing fun stuff. Yeah, sure. So I said, I'm Amanda, and uh, this will be novel number five. This is novel number five. And um, I am a mountain girl myself. I grew up by the mountains. So this was an especially fun, story to write because my other stories have taken me on page all over the world and this one felt just more like home you know I got to share a piece of my story in a way in in the book and as you said then to bring in uh, the Hollywood element was really fun too but I so I was born and raised by the mountains and um I'm a mom of four and in between that I and blessed to get to write, to write these stories. And um, it was a, always a dream of mine to do. So I just feel really grateful for the chance to do that. I love that. And I think for so many of us who are authors, it's one of those things that was a germ of a dream. And then at a certain point in time, there's like this moment when God kind of breathes on it and says, okay, now, what was that moment for you? When did you get that like little, okay, where it was like, God said, all right, I'm kissing yeah. it. Now's the time that you can pursue that dream that's been in your heart? Well, first of all, I think that's a really beautiful way to put it. I've never heard it put that way. And I think it's perfect. So I love that description. Um, thinking back, I think, as as I said, I always wanted to be a writer. And I, I, I used to be a teacher. So when I was teaching, I thought, I have this other dream as well. And I'm always telling my students to work towards your dreams, things like that. And maybe I should do that too. And so I thought, Part of me wanted to really, really wanted to write for children. And part of me really wanted to write for adults. adults. And so I'll start with the children's book because I can learn. You know, it's shorter. It felt a little bit less intimidating just because of the length. Um, I wouldn't say it's easier because it's just different. <laughs> but I started out with just a, they call it an early reader. I wrote an early reader. I found a publishing house that you could submit to directly without an agent because I didn't have an agent at the time. And that was my goal, finish something and submit it. And then I thought, whatever happens from there, we'll just see. So I finished this story that was based on um, an idea and a little story I had written in like second grade <laughs> called The Door in the Mountain, where these kids find a door on like on a mountainside. And so I wrote an early reader about that and I submitted it to this publishing house and they were so kind, they rejected it, but they like hand wrote some feedback on it, which was really good. And I think that as writers, one of the big blessings is we always get to keep learning. No matter where we are in the writing journey, we always get to keep learning. And so for somebody to offer knowledge and insight was such a treasure. And so I thought, okay, I've got a rejection. And at this point I'm at a crossroads, I can either say, I guess that wasn't for me, I'm not good enough, or it wasn't the right road, and just put that dream aside, or I can try again. So I thought, I'm going to try again. And this time I tried with a, a full-length novel for adults. And so I spent that whole novel, I think I wrote it in like six months, and I just was learning the whole entire time, just devouring writing craft books and um, listening to, there weren't really many podcasts on writing at the time, but more YouTube channels, things like that. And, and I wrote this book, took it to a conference and that's where I met my agent and, um, but it all goes back to that one little children's book idea. I love that. And that's such a cool journey because there's something beautiful about saying, okay, I'm always telling my kids in my classroom, you got to chase your dreams. You've got to chase your dreams. And then there's that moment where you're like, well, if I'm telling them that right. I need to do it myself. And I know I, as a professor, I have those moments where I'm like, I keep telling yeah. My students, my young women, you need to do these things. And I'm like, well, I'd better do it. Right. Too. right. So yes. There's kind of that accountability. <laughs> accountability, so, exactly. Yeah. So let's talk about Born of Gilded Mountains. So every okay. book also has that moment where you get that initial, well, what if? And it could be mm -hmm. research or it could be, you know, like a theme or a character. And I think every book's different and every author's a little different. So where did you get your initial 
What If or Spark mm -hmm. for Born of Gilded Mountains? Yeah, I love this question because every story has come to me in different ways, in different moments. Sometimes it's a character idea. Sometimes it's a setting idea. And in this case, it was I had seen. This is so funny, but it was just an Instagram post by somebody about an area of Colorado that they were visiting. And I wasn't familiar. Like I knew the name they were talking about <clears throat> Telluride. So I knew the yeah. name, but I didn't know personally anything about where that was in the Rockies or what it was like. <clears throat> and so I, I don't know if you're like this, but I feel like part of the writer gene or mindset is we're, we get curious, we get curious about things. And so I just started researching Telluride and learned it was in the San Juan mountains, which is a part of the Rockies. And there are many other beautiful towns around there too, like Silverton and Uray and Durango. And so I was reading an article about this area and something mentioned this vehicle called the Galloping Goose. And I thought, well, what's a Galloping Goose? I mean, how can you read that and not be interested? Yeah. So I started researching that's sort of part train, part bus part limousine it's really innovative and it's this vehicle that they created in order to basically keep the lifeblood flow to these mountain towns after the mining had dried up and it's that this needs to be in a book it belongs in a story and it built from there that is so funny because when I was started the book that's like in the first chapter is the galloping goose <laughs> getting the heroine up the mountain and it was like so for that to be the initiating point of the whole yeah. story, and then it's in the first chapter of like, but you still get a lot of pages after that, that you have to fill. That's true. That's true. And the Galloping Goose does make a reappearance. You'll learn more about it. And it actually plays kind of an important story role. So it was really fun to think, how can a vehicle play a big role in a story and to play around with that? It was fun. That's awesome. So you've said a little bit about why Colorado in the mountains, because you're a mountain girl. And I... You know, some people are like, I want to go vacation to the beach, put my feet in the sand. And I'm all about, give me the mountains. I'm from Western Nebraska. So I've always been a mountain girl. Um, but this is a long way from Hollywood. So, you know, you're connecting those two worlds, which especially in the 40s are still, it's not easy to get to the mountains. Right. So how did you connect those two? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the Hollywood element. Um, so I started to build a story set in this place, which you mentioned it being hard to get to, and it was it was very hard to get to because it's in you know up these windy roads and deep in the mountains and not anywhere near the places in Colorado like Denver that were easier to get to, and so um, it could feel like a reach. But I started looking at what else was going on at the time. It's the golden age of Hollywood. You mentioned that's your favorite. It is so interesting. And I really started to think that would be an, that would be a kind of a fun contrast, you know, the rugged mountain life versus this highly glamorous. Um, and I learned a lot about the history of Hollywood through the research of it. Just and it's very interesting. But as as contrasting as those two worlds are, they do share some things. You know, in a way, Hollywood was sort of a brand new world at the time. It was really only a few decades old, and it took a lot of grit and a lot of innovation and creativity to become what it was becoming. Just like these mountains, it took a lot of courage and grit and creativity and innovation to live there and carve out a life there. And so they're very opposite, and yet they shit, they overlap in surprising ways. So I started to think more and more about that and just weave those together. And now we have a book. <laughs> I love that. And it's, that's often how these things come is you get these disparate threads and then they just start kind of braiding right. together. And the next thing you know, you've got this elaborate plot that just is so seamless. Yeah. So, and I think that's what makes the story unique. It can make a story unique. Yeah. You know, when we just take things that don't look like they fit together and we go, how could they fit together? It's really fun. Exactly. And that's how you could take, someone else could write a book that takes Telluride and Hollywood in the forties and put them together and yet they'd be completely different because totally it's really different it's magic. <laughs> exactly. Cause that's the unique way that our minds take those different yeah. elements and start creating and seeing different yes. connections. So that's what makes it so much fun. So as you were doing all this research, because it is historical and it's clear that you really enjoy that piece of the process. What's one element that as you were digging into it, whether it's Hollywood or Colorado or even something we haven't talked about yet, that as you were going, you're like, this is so cool. 
but I can't put it in the book. Yeah, I love that question. And um, there's there's actually a lot, but one thing that comes to mind immediately is actually it's kind of a small detail, but it's so just unique and beautiful that I wish I could have found a way. But there was a uh, a railway there in Colorado during the mining times and really when they were trying to figure out how do we supply all these towns, how do we get gold out, that kind of thing. They put in this um, this railroad, I can't remember the name of it. I have a whole book on it. But the man who kind of headed it up, he, he was very innovative with his business mind and the way he thought of things. And one of the ways he funded it was to sell, if I'm getting, if I'm remembering right, is almost like selling a season ticket to the railroad. Like this, this beautiful ticket made of metal. And I can't remember what metal, but I'm picturing it like bronze. And it was carved and embossed with this beautiful, the name of the railway and then engraved with the name of the owner, the pass holder. And so they could present this and ride the railroad anytime they wanted. And I just, wouldn't it be amazing to have? Can you imagine that happening today? So that cool. sounds so beautiful. And then I could see you'd collect them and you'd put them up on your wall year after year. Yeah. That is so cool. That yeah. is innovative. Like a subscription service before now everything's subscription. Exactly. I know. There's nothing is, new under the sun. <laughs> yeah. That's so interesting. So as you think about this story, what's one thing that you hope readers will take away from it? I think when I think of this story, I think of the community. I think of the small town where it takes place called Mercy Peak. And I think of what that offers to people and why we as story consumers are drawn to settings like that, whether it's television or movies or books, there's something about the small town. This, I think it's a sense of belonging. I think it's a sense of safety. Um, and sort of contrasting with that, there's a sense of adventure because it's outside of the things that are well known. And I want to offer that to readers. I hope they feel like they belong. I hope they feel at home in Mercy Peak. I hope they feel kind of a sigh of relief as they come home to this place, but also some intrigue and adventure because there's mystery involved. There's riddles to solve. And um, so I hope it's comfort, but also adventure and hope. Those would be the three things I hope they take from it. Well, and as I look over your shoulder and I see the books you have on Dennis, I, I think that's a theme through a lot of your books, you know, where you're taking readers to places that they may not go on their own, um, like Venice, like the mountains of Colorado. And so you're inviting them along on an adventure with your characters. And I love that we as writers get to do that too. I feel like through writing a book, we get to become a part of a place in a way that we wouldn't normally have ever, even if it's just visiting a place, visiting a place, you become a part of it in one way, but writing about a, a place, you become a part of it in a different way. And it's kind of fun to think about. Absolutely. I'm getting ready um, in about two weeks after we record this, my family and I are headed to London for a couple of weeks on study mm -hmm. abroad. And I always say like, when you go for five to seven days, you're still very much a tourist. You start getting really comfortable. Like you can get around on public transit and things like that. But when you stay for two weeks or longer, you move beyond mm -hmm. a tourist. And it's Definitely. very much that way when you're living there in your mind um, as Definitely. a writer, because you you start embodying that place. And then when you, you hit six weeks, as because we've had a couple of times where we've gotten to stay on study abroad for six weeks. And you're like, at that point, you need to find a church. You need to start finding community because it's time to either embed or go home. And so That's those so are kind of my timelines. Yeah. <laughs> What a cool way to experience a place though. I'm excited for you. How fun. Yeah. And I'm like, I want to be looking around. I, I keep saying I want to be gobsmacked to buy a book idea. So maybe you are. it would be great. Um, London is the one place that I've been for an extended period of time. I studied abroad in London in college. So it was a long time ago, but um, you find those little corners of places and they'll stick with you for, you know, I found a place in London. Maybe you know it, or maybe you'll discover it. It's um, Cecil Court. And it's, wow. it's like cobbled street with old antique bookshops and it just feels like something straight out of a Dickens novel. And I loved it. And, you know, probably 15, 18, I don't even know, many years later, it ended up playing a role in a book of oh, mine that the stars alight. So yeah, I'm excited. Like you said, you're going to run into a story idea there. Yes. Yeah. So I can't wait because I've written one yeah. World War II story in Italy and one in Germany, uh, right okay. after the war. And so, but I'd like to write a more modern one, contemporary. Yeah. 
with a little oh, intrigue. So we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. I'm like, okay, guys, I'm just going to walk around and see what, what hits. So um, when you think about like writing and your journey, because you've got, this is your fifth book and I know it's not your last one, but if you were going to go back to the beginning as you were writing that children's book, or even as you were making the decision, okay, I'm going to actually try. Is there any advice you would give yourself as you were sitting there at your teacher desk going, okay, do I test it or not? Is there anything you would tell yourself? I think I would tell myself probably two things. One, just go for it because there's always a million reasons in our head where we're holding ourselves back. There's a million reasons not to do something. But so often when we have that tug in our heart and it's a repeated thing and it keeps coming up, I think it's oftentimes it's God telling us he built this into us and we should pursue it. And we don't always need an external invitation to do it for someone to say, we'll hire you to do this work. Or that's how we tend to work. We want sort of the external um, confirmation or affirmation before we step into it. But in these creative endeavors, they can be just this wild, like safe, but wild (laughs) um, journey with, with the Lord where to see what he want to teach me, not just what can I offer because it's more about what he's doing in our hearts and what he's going to offer our readers, hopefully, you know, through our work, how close can we grow to him through this? And how can I know him better through this? And, um, yes, what can I offer to people and hold our experiences with open hands and our hearts with open hands? Um, But also I would say in that, really embrace that freedom of we don't have to prove something. I think we are always, maybe it's just me personally, but I think, right, I have talked to other writers. It seems to be something that's a common, um, not affliction, but a common struggle is that there's so much thought of what will people think, what will the reviews say, what will the sales be? These are all measurable and visible sort of indicators of how well we did but if we can kind of cut ourselves loose from that and of course we hope for the we hope for the best with those things and there's nothing wrong with that but just to go did I offer everything I had to this story to readers to the Lord and can I rest in that and just let him take care of the rest so I think it would just I would urge myself to uh, my former my earlier self to at once be more courageous and just do it and also don't worry so much about the outcomes and just step out in faith and freedom because we can take our own freedom away by worrying about those things too much. Oh, I love that. I love how you said we can take our own freedom away. I am writing that down. Because yeah. <laughs> that is good. I, I think that I think their words just came easily because I've done it to myself too often. And so I know yeah. it well. Yeah, no, yeah. it's so true because we do. And it's so easy to get trapped in that comparison game um, right. instead of the celebration game. And exactly. I think in in Christian writing, we do a good job of celebrating each other, but there's still that can be that tag of, oh, they got on the bestsellers list. When's it my turn? Even as right. you're celebrating. Yeah. And so just it's to keep human our, nature thing. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and so even just being able to say, but I'm going to keep celebrating. I'm going to keep yeah. celebrating because that's, right. that's what it's all about. You know, if we're being faithful exactly. and, you know, every book's the best we can make it and we're doing what we, what we're being called to, then that's what it's about. Okay. So a couple of quick questions as we wrap up tea or coffee. Tea. Yeah. Hot or iced. Hot, always hot, uh, pretty much always hot. And my current favorite tea is the Paris blend. I think Harney and Sen makes it. It's It's really good with like some cream, some sweetener. It's the best. I made a note. We have such an elaborate tea collection. It's ridiculous. Um, and then salty or sweet? Oh, gosh, both. Like sweet with a touch of salty, like kettle corn. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And then paperback, ebook, or audio? I prefer paperback, but in this season of life, almost all my reading is done by audio. Yeah. Isn't it funny how I imagine you're like me, where there's so much time spent in the car driving kids around. Yeah. That yep. I switched to audio for a lot of things just to redeem the time. Absolutely. And I would have Me never too. thought. Never Me thought. too. Yeah. It's crazy how that works. But it is. it is. I found it actually helps me slow down and take in the story because I read so fast that it really makes the, the journey so fun. And I love um if you get a good narrator, if there's a good narrator yes. on a story, it brings a whole other dimension to it, which is really exciting. It is. It's so much fun. 
All right. Well, Born of Gilded Mountains comes out on June 18th and people can get it wherever books are sold. So wherever you'd like to buy your books um, and Baker Bookhouse always has great pre-release sales, which I love. In fact, yeah. I often buy things twice because I forget I pre-ordered them and Me I pre-ordered them again. <laughs> and actually, as we speak, I'm putting together my little pre-order bundles that Baker Bookhouse is putting out. So I've got... Um, Oh, they're all spread out. Bookmarks and stationery and stickers. And so that's what I'm working on this week. And oh, that will go out with all the, the Baker Bookhouse orders. I love them. Yeah, I love it. They do such a great job. And where can readers connect with you? My website is amandadykes.com. And that's thanks for social media and everything are on there. But if you're on so social media, I'm primarily on Instagram. And that does also post to Facebook. And again, the home base for that is all at amandadykes.com. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. This has been such a fun conversation. It has. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a joy.